This is a production of PBS Charlotte. Just head on Carolina Impact. In honor of Veterans Day, a story about fighting and writing in Vietnam and about the volunteer who made sure that the Marines mail got home, even if they didn't. Plus, we'll take you inside Central Piedmont's free eye clinic and learn about the fastest growing sport in the U.S. Carolina Impact starts right now. Carolina Impact, covering the issues, people, and places that impact you. This is Carolina Impact. Good evening, thanks so much for joining us. I'm Amy Burkett. This week we celebrate Veterans Day, honoring those who served in the armed forces and their families who sacrificed during that service. Tonight we have a story about the difference one person can make. One woman during the Vietnam War who helped hundreds of Marines overseas reconnect with their families back home when they needed each other the most. It's a story you'll only see on PBS Charlotte. Carolina Impact's Jeff Sonier and videographer Doug Stacker are at Charlotte's Vietnam Memorial with more on Lucy's Boys. Yeah, this is a story about all these names etched in stone and etched in the memories of friends and families. All these lost loved ones who served and died in Vietnam, as well as the wounded who uh, served and survived Vietnam. Mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, husbands and wives, all suffering and separated because of the fighting in Vietnam. Put the machine guns up here. Our team got hit and I got wounded. But still writing from Vietnam. From the house. They were all over us before we knew what was happening. Many letters asking for prayers, some simply saying goodbye. Pull up, pull up, boy. Get up there. Please don't worry about me. I love you, Clee. You know, let's let's tell your wife. Let's tell your wife what happened. Tara Reeves wasn't even born yet when her dad sent his letter from a Vietnam battlefield hospital, not knowing then if he'd ever see his family again. A young man from Georgetown, South Carolina. He's a very much decorated Marine, Lieutenant Cleve McClary. But in 1969, Cleve McClary made it back from Vietnam with half an arm a missing eye, and a story to tell. You have never lived until you nearly died. Maybe that doesn't mean a great deal to you. It didn't to me until I nearly died. About 10 or 12 of the enemy, what we call a SAPA unit, probably better known to you as a suicide squad, started running up the hill. These men had grenades tied around their waist. As I got near, another grenade came in. And it did, I threw my hand up, it exploded, it blew my left eye out. A couple other grenades came in and took the legs out from under. As I was going through the air, all I could think of was, man, where's my shotgun? As I reached back for it, I realized- I reached back my shotgun, I realized the blast had blown my left arm off. It's a story McClary still tells today as a retired Marine, now in his 80s, with his wife, Deanna, at his side. Oh, I begged him not to go to Vietnam. I pleaded with him but there's a Marine car in front of your house. <sighs> and this is happening every day in the same scene that we all know that when the car's there, it usually means they're dead. So when they and their the story car, of that night on that hill in Vietnam, well, it's still just as vivid now as it was more than 50 years ago. It really is, and, and, and they have a hard time because it, it brings back memories you're trying to put out of, your, out of your head, and I go blank on that hill quite a bit. I lay there, it seemed like hours. I never wanted to live so bad in my life. If I could only see my men get off that hill alive. If I could see my wife one more time. When he stood up there, they all stood. When he finished speaking, they all stood. But I was scared to death. Man, I was petrified. Even in the hospital, I really didn't know how she was going to react. She said, well, he's alive. I went, what? He's alive? The letter that came a few days later, dictated by her husband in his hospital bed, to help gave Deanna hope, and so, so did the letter also. writer. Lucy Caldwell, USO. And I thought, who is Lucy Caldwell to be in there with this bloodied body and sitting there letting me know he's alive? I always wondered. 
I've written this letter exactly as your husband has asked me to. It is an And years later, rereading that same letter, their daughter Tara so wondered too. To us all. Lucy Caldwell, USO. I started Googling Lucy Caldwell. I thought, you know, I'm just gonna explore who this woman is. Well loved and well remembered by all alumni. That search brings us to football Saturdays here at Princeton University. Here the Tiger fans cheer the first touchdown in the victory over Yale. Where Lucy Caldwell was the wife and widow of longtime Hall of Fame Princeton coach Charlie Caldwell. But at age 56 and now alone, Caldwell left her home in Princeton for Vietnam as a volunteer, spending three years at the USO in China Beach. The Princeton papers are filled with stories about Caldwell, known and denying as Lucy Baby, collecting donations from friends back home for all those weary Marines in the middle of a war zone. But in Vietnam's battlefield hospital wards, Caldwell was best known for spending countless hours comforting the wounded and writing hundreds of letters for those injured Marines known as Lucy's Boys, including a young lieutenant from South Carolina named Cleve McCleary. And uh, in this field hospital, he could not see, so he, he never saw Lucy. Hmm. But in this hospital, when he did regain consciousness, uh, this precious woman, and he remembers her sweet voice, uh, and probably the click of her heels. She sat beside his bed and befriended him. She got Daddy to talk about his patrol, and what I mean, that's that's a real gift. You know, I, I can only imagine her sitting next to his bed, just kind of coaxing it out of him. And what a tremendous role that was. I didn't know any of that till well, really, just recently, who she was. Yeah. But I remember her being there, and then she wrote some other letters too, I think. In fact, Lucy wrote a book about all those letters for all those injured Marines, letters that often prepared their loved ones for those injuries too. He was there in the bed, and he said, honey, it's me, it's me. I know I'm not too pretty to look at, but I thank God I'm alive to be with you right now. And for those Marines who didn't make it home from the hospital, well, many of those Lucy letters were also their last letters. Lucy was a mother too, and I think putting her heart in that mother's heart or that wife's heart, you know, this is what I would want to hear. But I think Lucy recognized the value in a handwritten note. These are treasures. By the way, the title of Lucy Caldwell's book is S-I-N One Way, Economy Class, which refers to her plane ticket to Singapore on the flight that eventually landed Lucy Caldwell in Vietnam. It's a flight that countless Marines and Marine families are glad that Lucy made because of the difference that Lucy made in their lives while she was there. Amy? Thanks so much, Jeff. The surviving Lucy's boys from Vietnam, including Cleve McCleary, are planning a reunion soon to celebrate Lucy Caldwell. Organizers are also hoping to start a public letter writing campaign in her honor, sending personal handwritten messages to U.S. service members stationed overseas. Well, the housing market is losing steam. Interest rates continue to rise, the stock market remains volatile, and inflation continues to be a major issue. It may all sound like doom and gloom, but here's a bit of good news. The job market remains strong. According to the U.S. Department of Labor, more than a quarter million jobs were added in the month of September, and the unemployment rate edged back down to a more than 50-year low at 3.5 percent. Carolina Impact's Jason Turzis shows us one career where the demand for qualified applicants is expected to continue to rise. Okay. Keep looking straight at my eye. Tell me what numbers you see. It's your typical routine eye exam. One. Except in this case, both the patient and doctor are actually students. Okay, good job. Switch over to the other side. Students going through real life scenarios of what they hope to someday be doing in the workforce. So look straight at my light. It's all part of Central Piedmont Community College's ophthalmic medical personnel program. The one year diploma or two year associate's degree program prepares students for a career in eye care. Within the program, we are working with students to 
develop skills to assist ophthalmologists. And that could mean anything from history taking and educating the patient to doing the actual vision test and assisting the physician in various procedures. Our program is not very well known. Not a lot of people know about an ophthalmic career. Um, a lot of people think that the assistants are nurses, so they think to go to a nursing path for, uh, would get you any type of medical um, profession, but we are very specialized. Hi, I'm Asa. I'm going to be taking care of you today. We're just going to be testing your vision. Just First year student, can... Madison Merck, goes so through the various 20, steps 30. of what she hopes to soon be doing in the real world. I never thought I'd be so interested in eyes and like learning different parts of the eyes and stuff like that. Like you wouldn't think like that's something that you'd be super interested in until you're in the seat. Now I just want you to tell me what fingers you see, okay? For Madison, taking classes at Central Piedmont is bringing her full circle. She started her undergraduate courses at CP several years ago before moving on to East Carolina University. I graduated in 2019. With a degree in hospitality management, Madison went to work in the hotel industry. I worked in the Sheraton Raleigh Hotel. I was a sales assistant. I basically did all the sales work, like the nitty gritty grass and putting in points for Marriott and stuff like that, learning about the hotel business. But less than a year after starting her career, the pandemic hit. And like so many others, Madison found herself without a job. So pandemic kind of killed the industry for me and it was really hard for me to kind of pick up a job after that because like no one was hiring during that time. After working some odd jobs to help pay the bills, she came back home to Charlotte. My mom suggested, hey, why don't you look into CPCC again? See what type of programs are available. So she did and that search led her to the Ophthalmic Medical Personnel Program. Alrighty, and then can you cover your right eye for me and then read the lowest line you can see. I love talking to people, that's like my thing. I love interacting with others and just, you know, getting to know people and like, and doing something that I'm like passionate about. I love taking care of people. So I'm just looking at her not covered eye right now. When she completes the program, there's a good chance Madison and her classmates will find plenty of job opportunities. Like many careers in the healthcare world, openings for this position are growing quickly. As far as demand is concerned, we are um, a field that is understaffed um, and is growing significantly. Um, they expect anywhere from 8 to 10 percent continued increased growth over the next 10 years. New employees entering the workforce make an average annual salary of over $36,000. The average for all workers across the United States is just over $50,000. In North Carolina, though, it's slightly less, at just under $48,000. But salaries can vary widely depending on education, certifications, additional skills, and the number of years in the profession. Some employees make over 60000 annually. And can you tell me what numbers you see? 12. At Central Piedmont, students learn in the classroom through hands-on experience in the lab and assisting in the college's new public eye clinic. Lion Services, which had been offering free vision exams and glasses to those needing financial assistance, closed its doors in March after more than 25 years of service. Lion Services then donated all of its equipment and supplies to Central Piedmont, which is now continuing the free program. These patients don't usually have access to eye care. In turn, that allows our students to work early with patients. The patients that we see here are from all different walks of life. This morning we had a patient who had lost his glasses in a fire and hadn't seen in five years. Had another patient who has been homeless and a drifter for the past 15 years who has been trying to wear over-the-counter readers which aren't working for his prescription. So when he got his glasses today during lunch, he started to cry. Helping out in the community for those who need the care, while at the same time training the next generation of eye care professionals. For Carolina Impact, I'm Jason Church's report. Thank you, Jason. The free eye clinic at CPCC is currently open two days per month by appointment only. The hope is to eventually add more days. So you might be surprised to learn last year Americans spent $14.7 billion on cheese. North Carolina's Ashe County cheese started back in 1930 by the Kraft Corporation. A lot has changed over the years. Jason Terzis is back to explain.
There's lots to do in the North Carolina mountains. You can take a hike, ride a horse, find a waterfall, or head to West Jefferson and visit Ash County Cheese. The factory is built in 1930 by Kraft Corporation. At that time, there's a lot of dairy farms in the area. They needed a place for all the milk to go, and they built a cheese factory here. Kraft operated the facility until the mid-1970s. And then they sold it to the DN plant manager. He owned it for a, a few years and then sold it to an investment group. They owned it for you know a couple years and then sold it to the family that currently owns it now. So it's been it's been in the same family since 1994. Co-owner Josh Williams serves as general manager at Ash County Cheese. I'm a Ash County native. I grew up here, came to the cheese plant, cheese store as a kid. Never thought I'd be working here or you know owning it and running it, but uh, it's, it's really neat. The cheese making process starts with one basic ingredient, milk, lots and lots of milk. Most of our milk comes to us from local dairy farms within about a 50 mile radius of the plant. We run about 400,000 pounds of milk through the plant a week and uh, make about 40,000 pounds of cheese. It's about a 10 to one ratio. It takes about 10 pounds of milk to make one pound of cheese. Brandon Hardin, also a co-owner, oversees cheese production. We start the plant up around midnight and we're gonna prep the plant for the, the day coming in. Then we will take the, the raw milk and we will run it through pasteurization into the vat. Uh, once the milk's in the vat, we will add um, a lactic acid creating bacteria to it. And then we will let that milk ripen with that in it. Then we can add color if it's a, a Colby or a cheddar or not add color if it's a Jack and we will, we will agitate the uh, lactic acid creating bacteria that we add to it. And we add rennet to it, the, the milk will coagulate and then we cut it in cubes and that separates the solids from the liquids. So the solids is cheese then and the, the liquid is whey. Workers drain off the whey, leaving behind the cheese curds, but they aren't done yet. Well, after the whey is drained off, then we will salt the cheese and we have an agitator that goes up and down and mixes the salt in with the cheese. The final step, packing the cheese curds into round forms and then pressing the cheese several times to form that familiar wheel shape. The work is labor intensive and the conditions inside the cheese making room resemble a sauna. Inside the facility, we, we try to keep it around 80 degrees and it's got a very high humidity. But the reason for that is when we uh, put that cheese in those forms and we press it, that cheese has to be kind of warm and you know, if it's cold, it wouldn't press and it wouldn't knit together properly. That's a hot, humid environment to work in, but I don't really hear that much complaining from the guys, so that's a good thing. In the back of the factory, workers prepare cheese for shipping and for sale in the retail store across the street. Inside, you'll find a wide selection of cheeses for just about any occasion. You can even get everything you need to create a charcuterie board and find a North Carolina wine to pair along with it. There's a lot of different varieties. You can go from a very mild cheese that don't have hardly any flavor to a pungent cheese. And cheese is so broad in the different flavors, you can't put it all under one category. Most everybody likes at least one kind of cheese or if not multiple. But William says there's more to Ash County cheese than just making a sale. It's very important to the area. You know, it, it brings a lot of people in the area and uh, we can kind of piggyback off of each other because like I said, West Jefferson's done a lot in the last few years to bring tourists in. They use Ash County cheese as a draw and then we can, and now we can use West Jefferson and Ash County as a draw to bring people to us. And outside of Ash County, its cheese can be found in stores and specialty shops across the Southeast, taking a bit of North Carolina history with it. It does have a lot of name recognition. And, you know, you can be traveling and go to a grocery store or to a deli or somewhere and see your product in there. It's pretty awesome. For Carolina Impact, I'm Jason Terzis reporting. Thank you, Jason. If you visit the factory Thursdays through Saturdays, you can enjoy the company's food truck with delicious poutines, barbecue pork belly grilled cheese sandwiches, cheese steak quesadillas, and so much more. Makes me hungry just talking about it. Now it's quiz time. Can you name the fastest growing sport in America? Here's a hint. It's probably not the first thing that comes to your mind. If you guessed soccer or baseball, you'd be wrong. It's pickleball. According to the U.S. Pickleball Association, 4.8 million Americans play this game. This year marks its 57th anniversary. While the sport first became popular with seniors, it's now catching on with younger folks. 
producer Russ Hunsinger visited Pickleball Charlotte to take us inside for the action. All right, you want, you want to start a game? One, one, two. People say you get the bug. Well, it's very true. It's a little bit, you know, addicting. You want to play more and more and more. It's very competitive, but it can also be casual if you want it to be. It's really good for any age. All yours. Whether you're old or young. When you're serving, you have to serve underhand below your waist. Two, one, two. You have to serve diagonally to the other square. And you can't hit inside a box called a kitchen. I think young people are liking this because it's fast paced. I got it. And it's fun to play with friends as I am now. That was a nice shot there. Oh, it's growing tremendously. The barrier to entry is very low. Financially, it's not expensive. Anybody can play and it's very generational, right? So it started out as kind of an old person sport. And I think as those people kind of got their kids, grandkids, oh. they talked about it and they said, oh, this is a great sport. And then once people play it, they really enjoy it. I mean, I don't know anybody who's played pickleball and then didn't want to play more pickleball. It started mostly in, in, at senior centers. And uh, now it's evolved to, you've got very young tennis players playing it. Uh, a lot of young people. It's probably the most fun racket sport I've ever played. I've played them all. And this is my favorite. And probably because I can still play it at a pretty high level at my age. I'm almost 85. My friends got me to like the sport and I thought it was an old people sport. I just, I really liked it. Tons of older folks playing this sport, but the younger generation is just sweeping in, especially tennis players and kids and teenagers. And it's such a fantastic sport because I do feel like you can play it for your entire life. Good spin, Henry. I got my grandson involved in it and now he loves it. Just having this that we can go and do together and enjoy together, it gives us time that I probably would not have with him, you know, through these adolescent years where kids usually don't want to be around their parents or grandparents. So that makes it a lot of fun. I've been playing for two years. Anybody can play this game because it's fun and you can, it takes just like kind of speed. It's a game of chess. It's a game of strategy. Pickleball is really attractive to the younger generation because it gives you something different than any other sport, such as the mental strength. The mental health is very important to the younger generation or even anybody that's an athlete. So I feel like pickleball is that one sport where you know how to utilize that to your mental growth. And especially at a young age, I feel like that's the advantage you have. I think it's fun, it's a good way to meet people. It's exercise, social activity, and I thought it, it would be good to try something different after playing tennis for so many years. When looking at the pros, there's a lot of young people coming up and playing, so I think that's like a, a good representation for the sport for young people. Um, and also I think a lot of athletes, college athletes, are looking for something different to do, and that was definitely my case. I think, I think it's a great way to exercise and also to be social. Nice shot. Which young people will like that. It's fun to play with younger folks because it makes my game better. You see older and younger folks playing together and they have fun and one complements the other. It's really great. It's, it's a great way to bridge the generation gap. Thank you, Russ. I'd love to learn how to play that game. It looks like so much fun. Pickleball Charlotte has almost 700 members. Here are a few famous people who play. Leonardo DiCaprio, The Kardashians, Stephen Colbert, Ellen DeGeneres, Bill and Melinda Gates, as well as George and Amal Clooney. So, ever catch yourself scrolling social media looking at everyone else's pictures of amazing places in nature? Well, look at a map and you're likely not too far from creating your own amazing adventure at one of North Carolina's state parks. Here's a little teaser to get you excited. <laughs> Camping, hiking, mountain biking, boating, all things you might enjoy in a North Carolina State Park. The mission in North Carolina State Parks is conservation, recreation, and education. People love state parks. They love taking their families to state parks. 
a lot of memories created at state parks. Around Metro Charlotte, the rat race of life might sometimes seem hard to escape, but just north, Lake Norman State Park. Whenever I get a new camera or if I just need some time away, I, so I just come out here, relax, take some photos. Photographer Dana White knows just where to go when seeking inspiration. I love the fact that there's a beach here. You can see so many different people here. Um, so I always have a different scene to shoot, different people to interact with. I love to see the nature and I love to see the seasons change. And so every opportunity I have for that. Each year, more than three quarters of a million people make their way to Lake Norman State Park for many different reasons. You feel like you're 100 miles from stuff when you're really not. If you're looking for a bit more adrenaline, you're in luck. Thanks to the Tar Heel Trailblazers, the mountain biking group made their mark on Lake Norman State Park by building over 30 miles of trails. For many who hit these trails on two wheels, it's often referred to as... We call it dirt church. It is just, it's peaceful. You come, you can come out with music and, you know, ride with your music or you can just, you know, have silence. Sometimes rubber doesn't meet the road. Sometimes the rubber meets the trail. With over 600 miles of hiking trails to explore in North Carolina state parks, it's easy to rack up the miles, one foot in front of the other, until you reach your goal. Well, we're at Crowder's Mountain. I love being here. It's one of my favorite mountains to hike. The trees, the shade that you get on the walks, and just the coming up here to see the serene view, I love it. The mountain that once faced strip mining now attracts nearly a million visitors each year. Crowder's Mountain State Park is it's a little over 5,200 acres. Our primary activity at Crowder's Mountain is hiking. There's also camping and, of course, fishing. And it's also only one of five state parks that permits rock climbing. It takes a significant amount of money to run a state park. The facilities require quite a bit of upkeep. The staffing involved uh, to maintain these facilities, you get to help a lot of people. We are in the business, the forever business, we like to say. We're part of preserving a significant area. As of January 2021, the North Carolina Division of Parks protects more than 250,000 acres of land and water. These protected natural areas will be around for future generations to enjoy for centuries to come. For Carolina Impact, I'm Jason Terzis reporting. Most North Carolina state parks are free to enter and you have more than 40 to choose from. There's so many wonderful stories to tell across our region and we need your help to learn about them. Send your story ideas to stories at WTVI.org. Well, that's all the time we have this evening. Thanks so much for joining us. We always appreciate your time and look forward to seeing you back here again next time on Carolina Impact. Good night, my friends. of PBS Charlotte.